Hi, welcome to the next of our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. We're going to move on and complete our electrostatics triangle here by talking about something called Poisson and Laplace's equation, which is going to sort of finish that side of the triangle we talked about last time that wasn't done. If you happen to be in my class, uh, the material in the book we're going to be covering in this lecture is, is given right down there. So briefly, what we covered in the last lecture is that uh, we represent electricity by charge, which is a fundamental property of matter. That gives rise to vector fields, which are electric force fields. And because we have forces, um, charges within those force fields have some kind of potential energy, and we call that potential voltage. And we can relate charge, uh, the fields, or the electric flux vector for working in a material, and the potential energy or voltage by these relationships that are given in the triangle, where we can move some ways with integral relationships and other ways with differential relations. And we have one piece that's missing, which is to go from the voltage or potential back to a charge distribution. Um, and that turns out to be a fairly straightforward thing to do now that we have the divergence theorem that was talked about in the last mini lecture. There we learned that the total flux into or out of some volume element, delta V, as long as delta V is really, really tiny so that we can uh, do a Taylor series expansion simplification, is given by this expression right here. And we can and can represent this by Gauss's law right here, which says if we take uh, del dot the electric flux vector d, or this is called the divergence of the electric flux vector, that's equal to the overall uh, volume charge density. Um, and essentially, if del dot d is positive, then we have fluxes, lines that are leaving a place. If it's negative, flux lines are going into it. It's called a sink if it goes in and a source if the flux lines are leaving. And if del dot d is equal to 0, there's no charge there whatsoever. And now we just basically do a little bit of mathematics. We know our electric field is given by the gradient of the potential v. We know <coughs> um, Gauss's law here that the divergence of the electric flux vector d is given by the volume charge distribution. And of course, we can just represent d as epsilon e. And so since if we do just a little bit of substitution, essentially what we can do is we can just substitute this term for the electric field down here. And that gives an expression where we take the divergence del dot the gradient of the potential. So we take this. And it turns out that this is called del squared of the potential v. And um, if we just basically copy the epsilon of the minus sign to the other side, we find that del squared v is equal to the negative of the volume charge density divided by epsilon. And this is known as Poisson's equation, because obviously a guy called Poisson discovered it. And if we write this all out in sort of longhand form, del squared v, del squared of the scalar potential field, is given by this. It's essentially just the sum of the second derivatives. And we're going again from a scalar field, which is the potential, to the scalar charge density, or amount of charge per unit volume, divided by epsilon. Now, for some strange reason, there's another form of this equation that happens when this charge density rho sub v is 0. In other words, uh, you're working in a region of space that has no free charge, which actually turns out to be, except in many types of semiconductors, really the case that's happening. And if uh, the charge density is 0, del squared v is equal to 0, and we call that Laplace's equation after Laplace. And this has completed our electrostatics triangle. Now we essentially have on the inside uh, differential or derivative type of relationships that uh, we can convert from charge to field and flux to potential or voltage. And on the outside, we have integral relationships. So we're really able to convert from one to the other. And we saw in the last video that we can go from charge to voltage to field and back to charge. And everything matches up if we do it numerically. And of course, it's going to work out analytically if, if we can figure out all the math. Now, this is all, all very useful in a way. But again, it's a little bit frightening to think about this term right here, Poisson's equation or Laplace's equation if the, the, the uh, charge density is equal to 0, because it is a second derivative equation. If we, if we go back up um, one more and take a look at this, we find that, in fact, we have second derivatives here. And it is a, a second order differential equation, actually a partial differential equation, because we're working in at least three different variables. So why do we do this? Why is it really useful? Why have we created this scary second order partial differential equation? Well, it turns out that, that Laplace's equation is actually 
pretty cool because there's some really neat ways to solve it. Not doing analytical stuff where the differential equations could get quite difficult, but doing numerical solutions to, Pla to Laplace's equation. So let's talk about it. Essentially, Laplace's equation becomes really useful when you know boundary conditions, when you know essentially what the potential is at the top, at the bottom, at the left side, and at the right side, but you don't know what the, the potential or voltage distribution is inside this area. And so in order to do a numerical solution, essentially we're going to divide this area up into a bunch of little tiny boxes, where, where these boxes are essentially so small, or, or the length of the box is so small, that the change in potential, delta V, across one of the boxes is tiny. This numerical stuff doesn't work if you say, we're going to have one big box. But if you make your boxes small enough, this stuff is going to work. And essentially what we're going to show is that we can calculate the potential at any point, um, x and y, and we're using, the, we're using sort of the dark orange box here to represent this, um, by essentially taking the average of the boxes that surround it. And essentially what we're saying here is, you know, the voltage changes pretty slowly on the scale of one of these boxes, so we can do an approximation um, to get the center value from the outer, outer edges. So how does this work? Well, well, let's do a little bit of mathematics and just play around with here. Essentially what I'm going to say is that I can make a pretty good approximation of the center box by, by summing up the box over on the left side and the box over on the right side. So how do I do that? Well, we go to our old friend, the Taylor series expansion again, we saw when we talked about divergence. And we can say that, that really, if we have the box over there on the right side at x plus delta x, using the Taylor series expansion, we can write it as the, the box in the middle, the darker orange box, plus a first derivative term, plus a second derivative term, plus a third derivative term, and so on. And if we think about the uh, box over on the left, where we're talking about x minus delta x over here, um, we can also do a Taylor's ex series expansion, but then we've got some minus terms. The first order is minus, the third order term is minus, and we've got a bunch of higher order terms out here because our value of delta x is so small. Remember, these boxes are small is what we have to do for all of this to work. That the, the delta x to the fourth is totally negligible. And when you sum all of these things up, you notice that this term and this term, the first order terms, are going to cancel out. This term and this term are also going to cancel out. And so your overall sum of the left box and the right box is just equal to two times the box in the middle plus this second order term with delta x squared. Well, we can do exactly the same type of thing for the top and bottom boxes in the y direction. We have y plus delta y here and y minus delta y here. Um, in that case, essentially, you do exactly the same type of thing. And you, again, see the first order terms and the third order terms canceling each other out. And when we sum it all up, you see the, uh, the top boxes, let's call it t up here, and the bottom box b, the sum of those two things is just equal to two times the box in the middle plus the second derivative term. And now we start to get a little bit of tr a little bit tricky here. If we sum up essentially the left box here and the right box here, the top box here and the bottom box here, and basically do a sum of all of this, what are we going to get? Essentially, all four of these outer yellow boxes are going to give you four times the center box um, plus a delta y squared term with a second order y derivative and the same thing for the x component. But now we notice something interesting, that since these are actually square boxes, delta y is equal to delta x because the sides are equal to each other. So essentially, we're going to rewrite um, delta x equal delta y as delta h and we can pull this delta h out here, and now notice that we've got part of Laplace's equation right here, um, at least working in two dimensions. We know if there's no charge, this is in fact equal to zero, and we come up with the following expression, just doing a little bit of rearranging. We notice the center box is equal simply to one quarter, that comes from dividing by four here, the sum of all the boxes on the top, left, right, and bottom. So, big deal. Um, we've done a spatial average. You'll notice that this spatial average, though, is giving us voltages that we don't know. So let's see how this works. So let's go back and put this in the middle of our grid here. Um, this is the thing that we're calculating. 
the center orange box. And we're going to calculate it simply by averaging the left, right, top, and bottom boxes together. And we just showed that we're allowed to do that by doing the Taylor series expansion and recognizing Laplace's equation. So we know we have no charge in this region. Um, so let's get rid of all of that. And what we're going to do is we're going to define on the edges a right voltage on the right boundary, a top voltage on the top, a left voltage on the left, and a bottom voltage on the bottom. And then we're going to move our little sort of uh, cross-shaped unit cell up to the upper corner where we've got the intersection of the top voltage and the right voltage. So we know what that voltage is right there because it's defined as the right voltage. We know what that voltage is right there because it's defined as the top voltage. So we can make a guess at what this voltage is at that square. It's a bad guess because we don't know what that is and we don't know what that is. So if we move our little cross-shaped unit cell over, we can calculate another voltage because we know what this voltage is here. We just calculated we know what this is. Again, we've got question mark voltages in here and here, so our guess is pretty bad, but at least it is some kind of guess. We can do this again, calculate the next voltage again with some voltages we know and some unknown voltages. And we're just going to move around row by row and calculate the voltages at every little place. We know that one, we know this one, that's unknown, that's unknown. You get the idea. So let's see what it looks like if we start again all over at the beginning. Now, if you have to do this by hand on a really fine grid, it gets really tedious. Um, but essentially what we're going to do is we're going to move on some kind of grid pattern our little cross-shaped thing and just move zipping along right like that across our whole grid. So we've gone through the entire grid and we, we've sort of estimated a voltage value, but you say, you know, this, this really isn't a very good solution because we didn't know a lot of the voltages and we just guessed at things or used zeros and so our results are going to be completely wrong. Well, that's where the power of computers comes in because we can program a computer to go through and do this just by summing up numbers pretty easily. And once we do it once, we're simply going to take the numbers we got which we know aren't that good but are better than guesses and we're going to have the computer go through and do it again, just zipping through, moving across the thing. And once it's done, then we're going to just keep moving along better and better and better as it moves around through it. And this should be making sort of a raster pattern, but my computer can't keep up with it. And every time we go through this, the numbers are going to get better and better and better. And we're going to tell the computer to keep doing this until the numbers stop changing to some, some small fraction like one part in a thousand or one part in ten thousand. So essentially we find this is very, very tedious to do by hand. This is not a technique you would do by hand with a fine grid of, of hundreds or tens or thousands of points. Um, but it's pretty easy to do if you have a computer. And there are lots of different ways to do it. This, this is a very sort of simple way of doing it. And there are a fair number of professional software packages, Sonnet, ADS, FemLab, things like that, that will do these types of calculations very rapidly with very great precision. You can also do this in uh, general numerical software like MATLAB. You've seen some MATLAB demonstrations at all. But surprisingly, you can do this calculation I just showed you in less than five minutes in the Microsoft Office package Excel. So let me stop here, and I'll start up a, a new little video that shows you how to do this in Excel to solve this exact problem. So here I've opened up an Excel spreadsheet. This is just a standard Excel. Um, let me move things down so you can see this is just Excel 2010. Um, and essentially what I've done is, is I've basically formatted a grid. You can see that over here in the center I've just basically turned on my grid so we have a bunch of spaces and I've colored the cells black for the boundary. Uh, what we want to do is we want to put in our formula, say starting in this cell right here, of what the um, four things we need to average to get the potential is. So I'm just going to go up here and uh, paste in that value. So, so essentially this cell over here which is um, B2 is basically B1 plus A2 plus C2 plus B3 and then I basically multiply that by one quarter. The reason that this cell has the green color is you can't see it but I'm going to go up to the top bar and click on conditional formatting and choose color scales and basically format it to uh, where green is the lowest and red is the highest. The next thing that we need to do is define the boundary conditions. That's why I've labeled all these cells black. So essentially, let's set the uh, 
the top boundary condition to be 10 volts and we can easily fill that in by simply dragging across there the way Excel does. Uh, let's set the uh, one over here on the left to be 5 volts and we'll we'll fill that in. Uh, let's define oops, let's define the ground sale here to be 0 volts um, along the bottom and we'll fill that in as well. Okay, come on you. And then let's define the one over on the right side. Um, well, let's just also make it 5 volts, not a problem at all. Um, good enough. Now, the next thing we need to do is to copy this cell into all the other ones. So let's copy, and then we'll basically just uh, highlight the whole area and paste that cell in. And you notice that basically everything's 3.8 volts. This isn't the behavior we expect. And that's because essentially what we need to do is turn on iteration. Now I've paused the video and I've moved this so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to go to the File menu here in Excel, and I'm going to go down to Options and we'll pop up a box here and move it over so you can see it and you'll notice if I go over to formulas we can have something called enable iterative calculations and we'll just basically uh, keep the standard settings right there. Now let's watch what happens when I um, enable these iterative calculations. Boom! All of a sudden we've calculated the potential distribution of Laplace's equation in just a few minutes in Excel. Now once I have this set up, it's really easy to go and change things. For example, if I want to go over here to my boundary conditions um, and basically instead of 5 volts make that 0 volts, let's just do that and we'll, we'll copy that down. Uh, the same thing here, and you notice things change, we'll copy 0 volts there. Um, and once we grab it, we'll put it down. You'll see that Excel does this calculation very readily and we can watch the potential distribution change in near real time.